Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Get More Jobs Done in Less Time, How TBG Landscape Employees Increase Productivity. This webinar is brought to you by our sponsor, Caterpillar. I'm Allison Barwatz from North Coast Media, Digital Editor of Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we begin, I'm going to go over some ways that you can participate during today's presentation. Although you are currently in a listen-only mode, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in the lineup. You can also submit questions via Twitter by using the hashtag GetMoreDone. Questions that were submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be answered in this webinar. Some questions may also be covered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in one of our e-newsletters. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. In addition, you can earn one Landscape Industry Certified CEU from the National Association of Landscape Professionals, formerly Planet, by watching this webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, Use the same Q&A box at the bottom right to tell us about your issue and click Submit. An assistant producer, Diana Safranek, or I will personally assist you. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. You can get to that page now and bookmark it by clicking on the header above your slides. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. Now, I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor, Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Allison, and welcome to all our attendees. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend our webinar. We have some excellent content lined up for you today, um, but first I'd like to thank Caterpillar for sponsoring today's session, and also to thank our speaker, Mike Lasecki, for presenting. Mike has served for 10 years as Director of Operations at TBG Landscape um, in Brooklyn, Ontario, and he also serves as um, COO of LMN, the Landscape Estimating and Time Tracking software company that sprouted from TBG Landscape. And he's presented these real-life landscape business management experiences from TBG to more than 3,000 landscape contractors from Australia to Boston and just about everywhere in between. So we're really excited to have him here today. And before we get started with Mike, we'd like to bring on John Janes from Caterpillar's Building Construction Products Division to give a welcome. So John. Thank you so much. This is John Janes from Caterpillar, and I extend a big thank you to Landscape Management Magazine for doing all the logistics and putting all this together, and additionally to Mike Lasecki of LMN. Mike and LMN are the only business improvement workshop that Caterpillar sponsors, and in addition to webinars like this, Caterpillar also sponsors up to 40 times a year a two-day workshop conducted by Mike, and it's conducted at Caterpillar dealers across the U.S., Canada, um, and Australia. To everyone in the audience, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules, and I turn this over to Mike. Very good, and uh, I'll keep my thank yous brief. Um, just to get moving here, but again, thank you Caterpillar for sponsoring us and for Landscape Management Magazine for hosting this and for all of you for taking some time out of your undoubtedly busy day to uh, to sit with us and go through this. I will start by just introducing uh, ourselves as a company. Uh, I work uh, as Director of Operations, or more accurately worked as Director of Operations for about 10 years for a company called TBG Landscape. We're located out of uh, Toronto, Ontario basically and um, do a bit of everything, design, build, maintenance, uh, snow and ice. We are from Canada, so we get plenty of that. Uh, mostly about 70% construction, 10% maintenance, and about 20% snow and ice. Uh, but I've done sort of run the gamut. Um, 
the owner of, of the company, is, his name's Mark Bradley, and I'll refer to Mark throughout this presentation. He started the company out of his backyard uh, about 16, 17 years ago now um, as a really small residential uh, design build company. Um, started just working around his neighborhood, doing small front yard and backyards. Uh, and the company grew and grew over the years, taking on um, certainly more work. We've grown in volume, but also uh, more significant work in terms of project size. So we've had experience doing everything from two and four thousand dollar front yards all the way up to eight million dollar residential estates and, and city parks and properties. Um, really, sort of had some experience in a whole lot of different um, elements. One of the one of the most interesting things about TVG, and certainly in, in my experience working there, has been watching us grow and watching us try to continuously improve. What you should be able to see on your screens now is just a copy of um, Landscape Management's top 150 landscape contractors from 2014. We're right around the middle of that list. Um, I think you can see us there at, uh, at about slide or number 76. Um, the sales volume and the growth from TVG has been great and continuous and steady, but what we're most proud of, and certainly uh, I was had the most fun watching as, as Director of Operations, was our efficiency. And the column that's highlighted now in blue on your screens is a column that shows the number of full-time and part-time employees. And if you look at, at our numbers compared to a lot of our peers, uh, you'll see that staff runs at about half and sometimes even a third the levels of some of our peers. And for those peers who do maintenance, obviously you're going to need more staff to do the same volume and maintenance. So there's, there's obviously some, uh, uh, it's not necessarily a black and white comparison, but regardless what you're seeing is a company that is uh, among the, the top in, in North America, if not the world, at efficiency, at productivity. We get a lot of sales out of each employee. And I think pretty much every owner on this planet would like to see their companies deliver more and knows their company has the potential to deliver more. And that's what we're going to look at today. One of the most important concepts, I certainly I learned from Mark and, and continue to watch him implement in, in the company is that there is a big difference between cost saving or saving money and making money. And they're not always the same thing. And a lot of times we see or I hear stories it's a lot of short-term decision makings where someone looks at the cost of something and says, oh, that sounds too expensive, I'm not going to do that. When in reality, if you look at the big picture, it's not the, it's not the most expensive decision. The most expensive decision is, is not having whatever that is, be it a piece of equipment or, or some level of uh, efficiency, training for staff, bonus programs for staff, higher wages for staff. Uh, all these things fall under the same umbrella. With just, ne just because you're necessarily paying lower wages doesn't mean – you're actually saving money. Maybe lower wages are leading to worse employees, which are leading to lower productivity, which leads to higher overhead and less profit, and therefore to save a dollar to an hour on wages, which looks like you're saving money. It's actually costing you money in the long run. Mark's always been really, really good at uh, identifying and, and rallying our company around these kind of concepts, looking at the big picture, not necessarily what's the cheapest short-term decision, but what's the decision that makes the company the most money in the long run? Because ultimately, that's all we care about. Um, I've sort of organized this presentation into four topics, four keys to getting more done in less time. I'm sure if you catch me on another presentation, it won't just be four. I don't mean to say that there's only four or that they all fit into these categories, but it seemed neat for this presentation in terms of our time constraints. I'm going to talk about the way um, we estimate, because that's a key part of getting more work done on time. Um, number two is probably going to be the most important concept we cover, which is maximizing job velocity or the speed at which jobs get done. That's the, the title of the presentation. And then looking at having a, a lean office and, and engaged staff supporting that, that job velocity and the productivity in the field. So we'll start with the estimates. And, and right off the bat, the most important thing about getting work done on time is to have legitimate times in which you expect to get the work done. And that includes uh, how long things should take, what equipment should go uh, to that job, how we're getting materials to and from the job, what materials are coming to and from the job. And if we're just pricing by square foot or by ballpark, gut instinct, uh, then it's really impossible to expect that our crews are ever going to be able to rally around a production goal and, and improve. 
the year starts for us at TBG with a budget, and the budget's sort of the baseline for our accountability. Um, we're going to set a sales goal, and then based on historical averages, we can predict fairly accurately what we're going to need to spend in wages and equipment and materials and overhead to hit that sales goal. And we can look out across the last three, four years, and as long as we've broken down and can report from our accounting on these expenses, it's fairly predictable that if we're going to do a million in sales, we're going to spend, you know, whatever it is, $240,000, dollars $250,000 in wages. That's about the sweet spot. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that's the only number that's going to change for different companies, but just as an example. And we can also predict roughly about how much equipment we can afford and what, what material costs will be on that sales volume. Again, looking at our historical averages. These averages are hard to give out as a universal average because the more maintenance you do, the less materials you're going to have. The more construction you do, the more uh, materials you're going to have. So it's hard for me to give a, a, a global average that everybody should abide by. It's sort of impossible. Um, but the numbers on the screen are you know, fairly realistic for a design-build company, for instance. We're going to start from there. And that will help us set the goal for the company. So if our goal is a million dollars or $20 million, from there we're going to estimate how much we should spend on these other things in order to make a profit. Ultimately, after we take away these expenses and some other ones that aren't on the screen, equipment rentals, et cetera, uh, we're going to end up with a predicted net profit. Once we're happy with that mix, we can go about estimating. The key part of that, and the reason why it's highlighted, is the overhead. Um, because we want to make sure we're doing enough sales to make a profit and cover our overhead expenses and have an overhead recovery method that works its way into the estimate. The other key part that's maybe not so obvious is the field wages. Once you know the field wages, you can accurately set budgets for your crews, and that may involve having, it will involve having different goals for different divisions. So a maintenance division is certainly not going to hit the same level. Three people in maintenance will not do the same level as sales, as three people in construction, since the three crew members in construction have materials to help increase their sales. So there will be different goals by division, but ultimately, you can see here on the screen that I've got a sample company where they say 24% uh, of sales will be spent on field wages. So you can turn that number around and give the crew a goal, a productivity goal or a production goal, sales goal. Sales goal is what it is, but it's sort of a confusing term when you talk about a crew. We don't expect them to sell the work. We expect them to produce the work. So we call it a production goal. And if I know that my field wages should be 24% of sales, then all I need to do is take a foreman and take their wages annually. So estimate what their annual wage would be. Add, for example, two laborers, whatever the size of the crew is. Obviously, you're going to flex it to the size of the crew. And, and add their estimated wages. So if, for example, the foreman and the two laborers were expected to make $90,000 at the end of the year, all told, then all we need to do is divide their wages by 0.24, that's 24%, to come up with their production goal. So that would be the goal we'd set for them at the beginning of the year. You as a crew need to hit this in production. And then we'll just simply uh, flag our invoices by crew. So as we invoice jobs, will assign that invoice or part, part of an invoice sometimes. Sometimes it's just the planting part of an invoice to a crew. And by the end of the year, we can then track which crews did what in production, whether they hit their goals or not. So that's the benchmark of the starting place for accountability. And there was a few questions, uh, written questions in before the webinar that dealt with that. That's a quick answer to it, but I tried to work that into the presentation here. Once we have that goal or that production goal, um, we have then sort of some benchmarks by which our estimators should use to estimate. Number one, and most importantly, is an overhead recovery system. So there's estimating software that our estimators use so that they can predictably and consistently, no matter who's estimating the job, come up with the right price for the job. The job of the estimator then becomes how many hours, what equipment, what materials, how are we disposing stuff, uh, what subcontractors are involved. And all they need to do is quantify these things. The estimating database takes care of saying, okay, this is how much these things cost, this is how much overhead needs to apply to this job, and this is what our price to be. And we can flex overhead using, say, a multiple overhead recovery system or some of the other ones to make sure that jobs that have a lot of labor cover more overhead and jobs that maybe have more materials that are easy to order to manage would, would recover less overhead, make us more competitive on the kinds of jobs that we actually want to win. And those jobs would be the jobs with less labor and more materials for our purposes. 
the benefit is that all the estimators don't necessarily need to see all the details of the budget. It doesn't have to be an open book company. They don't need to see what overhead is in terms of what I make or what the owner makes or what rent is. All they need to do is follow the overhead markup system, which sort of gives them a percentage and says, okay, the, or percentage is in the case of multiple, this is how you need to price your work. When they price their work by saying it's this crew and this equipment and these materials and here's the quantities, they can turn that over and that sheet of paper you see there on your screen is, is what we use as a job planner. And that's what gets turned over to the foreman as the starting point for making sure the job gets done on time. So the company has a time to make the plan. The estimator's taken the time to turn the job into a plan and then that plan is then turned over to the crew without prices and costs necessarily to give them the goals that need to happen to get the job done on time. We've always found that by uh, giving our estimators these tools and, and by giving our designers and even foremen before the job is sold these tools, we can really look at the job and try to value engineer it and try to see, well, if we use this piece of equipment, we could save this many hours. Or if we uh, cut the stone to this thickness, we have less cuts and uh, shapes and all sorts of things. And when it, when it comes time to really looking at a job, when we're trying to refine our price, the old rule of thumb we've always used is it seems like an hour of planning or value engineering, as we like to call it, can save us about 10 man hours in the field. That's about two to three crew hours. Uh, so certainly spending time over that job plan or looking at it and trying to find a faster, more efficient way to do the work now that the work's been estimated has led us to ways that help get the job done faster. If we can save 10 man hours in the field on this job, well, that's 10 man hours we can sell somewhere else, or we have 10 more man hours to complete another job. So we're increasing our job velocity, which brings us to the next slide. And that's what we're really going to talk about in this section. And a lot of the questions in the, in the written questions um, can be answered in one way or other by looking at job velocity. So job velocity is just a fancy term for how fast we get the job done. And um, we can improve job by, uh, velocity by value engineering the job or the estimate, really looking at the job before we even start to say, how could we do this job better, faster, cheaper? Uh, we can also improve job velocity by using the right tools and equipment. So again, that goes back to that saying that Mark did about, you know, sometimes the the, um, the cheapest way to do the job in the short run, that saving money in the short run, isn't isn't always the same thing as making money. And sometimes a more expensive, and I'll put that in quotes, way to do the job, is actually a more profitable way to do the job when you look at it in the big picture. And we'll take a look at some examples of that in a second. Then there's also on top that crew and foreman training is a good way to increase job velocity. A lot of companies are guilty. Um, certainly over our history, we've, we have been guilty of this in the past, uh, of just throwing people out there and saying, I get to work and expecting that it'll all happen okay in the field. And in reality, it, it doesn't. Uh, you got untrained workers without good systems uh, repeatedly making mistakes that cost us not only money, but uh, valuable production time. And then uh, last, accountability to the estimate and accountability to the goals that have been set both on a job level and on, a, on a, an annual level. And all these four things have really helped us increase our job velocity to a point where we're significantly ahead of our peers in the industry in terms of uh, project speed and, and revenue done per person. Let's just take a quick look at the materials and, and or I'm sorry, the equipment and tools example. And what I want to do is just illustrate uh, a simple excavation project and Maybe it's a backyard excavation. It's kind of tricky access or whatever, but it's just it's a significant area or sizable area. Sometimes it seems cheaper to just throw a couple of guys at it and let them dig away. And if we were to do this fictional job by hand, I'm going to suggest that we're going to put three guys on this job for two days, and they'll have this area dug out and wheelbarrowed back into the truck and the, and the fill out. And if I was to estimate that job, and I'm just using, say, $45 an hour as a, as a random hourly rate for the for the crews, you know, 60 man hours is going to cost us about $1,200 in wages. And if I was to charge $45 an hour, I'd, I'd charge about $2,700 for that work. And uh, the truck and tools, I got a truck on the job for two days. The crew's got to get there somewhere. Uh, and the tools on that truck have a cost. And so I'm going to put another $200 in that for the, for the truck in terms of cost and, and charge that at about $250. Uh, so my net price is actually $2,950. It says $2,975. That should be $2,950. And the cost of that job is about 1400 So that's doing the job by hand. Now, there's a better way to do that job, even though it may seem more expensive. If we put, say, a, a small piece of equipment, like a, a, tip, a dingo might be a good example, 
on that job, we can improve the speed of that job. We can take that job from taking three guys two full days, and maybe we could do it in three guys in a day and a half because they have that dingo to, to dig faster and, and move materials faster. So that shrinks my labor hours, 45 man hours, and I'm using the same cost and price. And I've put the truck and tools in there again, and I've also included a dingo in there again, or at this time. So I've got the cost of the equipment, and I'm not being cheap on the cost of the equipment or the price on the equipment either. I'm charging $200 for a day and a half of dingo, which will almost cover, say, a lease payment on that dingo for the entire month. So there's, there's enough money in there for sure to recover the cost of that dingo in the truck. But what you should notice is that my estimated price is cheaper. I've gone from $29.50 down to $24.25. And my costs have gone down. So even though the dingo may be seen as a more expensive piece of equipment, it's reduced labor enough that my overall cost and my overall price to the customer has come down, which is good. Um, allows us to be more competitive on price, and also we're going to get the job done faster. Now I can take that one step further and look at maybe a best way to do that job. And you know, provided access is, is, if it's big enough for a dingo, it'll be big enough for a Mini X and a power wheelbarrow. So we could look at, say, putting a power, a mini X and a power wheelbarrow on that job. And now I've got an entire day saved. It's not going to take me two days to, to do this job anymore. In fact, it probably wouldn't even take one full day, but I, I estimated one full day just to keep it realistic. Crew labor hours have dropped and my price, uh, because there's less hours, has dropped. But again, I've got the truck and tools, I've got the mini X, and I've got the PR or wheelbarrow in there for an entire day. Even though those things are seen as expensive pieces of equipment, and, and most companies would balk at having a dedicated Mini X on a construction crew and a dedicated power wheelbarrow, and by that I mean one that goes with them all the time. But if you look at it in this context, having that, minima, that Mini X allowed them to shrink the time it would take that excavation by an entire day. And even though I've put in $225 a day for the Mini X, which again covers at least half that Mini X's lease for the month. Same with the power wheelbarrow. I've got $125 in there. That's going to be half that power wheelbarrow's lease for the entire month recovered in one day. And what I've done is drop my estimated cost and drop my estimated price significantly. So we've gone from a price by hand of $29.50 to a price of $18.25 using, and I'll put this in quotes, more expensive equipment. Um, ultimately, in the big picture, it's not more expensive. What is expensive are the guys carrying the shovels and, and the time and the resources invested in hiring and training and managing people. And if we can reduce our dependence on that by using more equipment and the right tools, we got all sorts of advantages. And we'll take a look at a couple of those advantages right here. Advantage number one is price. So the job, if I was to estimate it by hand and charge the very same rates for labor and all that with equipment, I go from a job that would probably cost $29.75 by hand down to $24.25 using smallish equipment like the Dingo, down all the way to $18.25 with the Mini X and Power Wheelbow, even though that would be seen as a more expensive way to do the jobs. Again, expensive in quotes. Ultimately allows me to be a lot more competitive on that price. We can also look at the second advantage, which is revenue per hour. Most of us, if not all of us, have a significant problem in this industry of hiring, keeping, and training people. So the way we look at growing our sales is how do we grow our revenue per person? It's always going to be a significant challenge to grow people, to, to find more people, to keep more people, to train more people, to promote more people. That's our biggest challenge. I think all of us have that. So a way around that challenge or a way to make that challenge less is to increase the revenue each person does. I don't want to have to hire 100 more people to do more revenue. I'd like to try to find 50 more people who do twice as much revenue. And in this example here, if you just took the price of the job, even though I charged far less for the Mini X uh, and Power Wheelbarrow example, if I took the price of the job and divided it by the number of man hours by that job, so I'm just taking total price divided by man hours, we can calculate out uh, what we're earning per person per hour by hand with equipment and then with uh, more significant equipment. And my revenue per hour is better with the equipment. So that means each person is doing more revenue, and that added up at the end. In this case, it's about 20% more revenue. So at the end of the year, if I was to do this multiple times, you, you could see a company legitimately earn at least, and I'll show you why it's at least in a second, but at least 20% more revenue just on this alone. But we can take this a step further and look at um, a third advantage, which is the opportunity for more sales that we just gained. 
So if you look at the, I'll use the crew by hand as the baseline. If it took two days to do that job, okay, it took two days. Now, if we were able to save half a day by using the dingo, well, now I have half a day to work on other elements of that job or perhaps even go off to a different job and do some work there. But I've sort of gained half a day that I can use to generate more revenue. And if we take that a step further and look at the Mini X and Power Wheelbarrow example, we shaved a whole day off that job. So it's not just the cost savings of that day, it's the opportunity for, to do more revenue during that day. And that would equate in a typical landscape construction company to about 675 on a half day. So you, you, a crew, a three-person crew, generate about 675 conservatively in, in a half day's work. And a full day's work, and again, I'm thinking I'm being pretty conservative on these numbers, a, a landscape construction crew could generate at least $1,350. That's, that's found money. That's money that would not have been earned necessarily when we're doing it by hand. Um, it's increasing the amount of time available. So if, if you took every job you did last year and shaved a day off it, or in maintenance, shave, a, shave an hour off of each day's routes, uh, well, then that means at the end of the year you'd have weeks of opportunity to do more work and therefore increase your sales for, let's get to the last advantage here, for, or the second last, for the same overhead and fixed equipment costs. So keeping in mind, it doesn't cost me any, if I do that job by hand or I do that job with the Mini X, it doesn't cost my cell phones any more money, my rent doesn't change, my office salaries don't change, uh, computer costs don't change. All these things stay the same, whether it takes me two days or, or, or one day to do the job. But if I can do that job in one day, then effectively I've reduced my overhead in half because I now have two days to do work for the same amount of overhead. Uh, I'll generate more sales for the same overhead. So in a sense, it's reducing my overhead. Not technically reducing my overhead, but as a percentage, it's reducing my overhead. Since as I grow my sales without changing overhead, overhead becomes a smaller and smaller percent of our expenses. And finally, uh, one of the key advantages we get out of this is just happier crews and happier customers. So again, keeping, retaining, incentivizing people is our biggest challenge. And we certainly find it the easier we make their work, uh, the easier it is to keep and, and retain people. Uh, I don't think I'd ever define it as easy, but uh, yeah, you hear a lot, and, and even some of the questions in the, in the uh, written and before the webinar dealt with how do we uh, motivate and, and keep and attract this young generation, which doesn't seem to have the same work ethic. And I really, you know, we really don't have any good answers for that either. But, you know, if you're so worried about the young generation who grew up on video games and maybe doesn't have the same work ethic, driving equipment is about as close to a video game as we're going to get in our industry. So, I mean, it gives them something, <coughs> excuse me, to enjoy rather than just manual labor. It's easier. It's more fun. Uh, the other advantage is that by shrinking job times, we're also ending up with happier customers. You know, you've only got so many weeks a year, especially here in Canada, maybe less so down in the south, but you only have so many weeks a year to enjoy your property and to be outside. Or even if you're down south and you have all year, the last thing you want is construction guys coming in and out and making dust and making noise and making a mess, and they're there at 7 in the morning. And The less time we can take doing that, the happier our customers are. So by doing equipment um, and using the right tools for the job, we end up with happier employees and happier customers. Some of the key metrics that sum all this up, so when we do an estimate, these are some of the things we look at at the end of the estimate or before we present it from a selling to make sure that this estimate is going to um, be, be priced at a, at a price that we're going to be happy with. Number one is revenue per, per man hour. So we want to make sure that each job that we do hits a certain target for revenue per man hour. And that, again, is going to be quite different between construction and maintenance. It's significantly higher for construction since you've got materials being installed but we'll have a benchmark for that. And you could use your budget to reliably set a benchmark for that simply by taking your sales goal and dividing it by your, um, your man hours, your crew hours that you would expect to have. So you have the number of employees times the number of hours they'd work in a year and add those all up together. That would give you as a company wide, that's our revenue per man hour that we need to hit. Now, to be accurate, you should divide it up by division because each division is going to have different targets. But once you've got that, then you can compare your estimate against your revenue per man hour benchmark to say, is this a job that's getting me closer to my sales goal or hurting my progress to my sales goal? The lower the man, revenue per man hour, the less interested I am in, in the job. Net profit, 
goes without saying. That's obviously something we all want to look at and manage. And then uh, the third one, there's labor ratio. And what labor ratio is, is the expected cost of wages, the estimated cost of wages, divided by the estimated price of the job. And the lower that labor ratio is, the better for us. That, that means we're getting more work and more time in more work in, in, in less time. Obviously to a point, right? If it's too low, then that's all, that could be a warning flag that, hey, we haven't estimated enough hours into this job. We, the estimator may have been too aggressive in their estimates. So there's a couple ways to use that, but it certainly comes in handy. Uh, finally, in terms of improving the velocity on the job, communication is key, and that starts with foreman to crew. So the foremen are mandated to have crew meetings multiple times a day. And so for some of you that are starting with this, it could be morning, lunch, and, and evening. Um, the foreman talk about what, what the goal for the today is. So if that foreman doesn't have a, a, an end-of-day goal, and that goal might just be, you know, have the driveway excavated or have the plant beds prepped or have all the plant material in, I, the goal could be whatever it is. But if that foreman doesn't know the goal, then we're pretty much guaranteed we're not going to get this job done on time. So that's, that's an imperative starting point, that the foreman has thought out, I've got five days to do this job. Here's where I need to be at the end of each day to make sure I'm on track. And that's the foreman's job. And they do that in conjunction with the job planner that we give them in the estimate. So they're going to share that with the crew. Today's goal, we need to have this driveway entirely excavated by the end of the day. Now that sets the goal for everybody. Next, they ask themselves, do we have enough labor and equipment or do we have the right labor and equipment? And, and a very important question here, very important for the foreman, is do you have too much labor? If you've got an extra labor, it's great to know in the office because I may have another foreman somewhere else who could use the extra labor. So that's a key question to be asking both at the beginning of the day but even more importantly at the end of the day. So if you think tomorrow you don't need three guys, you only need two guys, let us know so we can try to reallocate that third person somewhere else where it will help our efficiency on another job. Uh, thirdly, do we have the right materials? And by that, I really mean, you know, are they ordered? Are they staged? Are they teed up for delivery or pickup or however we're getting them? Are they ready for tomorrow and the next day? Uh, and, and lastly, and a question not to forget is, are we missing any information? So does the foreman know all the colors and measurements and lengths and layouts and grading? And do they have all the questions they need to do their work today, tomorrow, and the day after? Uh, a whiteboard in the back of the trailer, especially for those you have closed trailers, could just be a, a clipboard in the truck. But a nice whiteboard mounted on the wall in the back of a, a covered trailer really, um, really helps the meeting sort of center around that whiteboard, and stuff can get written up there as well as stuff that the supplies of the trailer is running out of. So it's sort of in everybody's face every, every day, and the foreman doesn't forget to then email that off whenever you like to email the office to, to bring them into communication. Um, uh, then, in, at TBG, the foreman is, is asked to send Mark a daily four at the end of the day. And the daily four is Mark's way of, of uh, staying on top of the jobs as they happen. So Mark can't possibly be on all our jobs at one time or know what's going on on all our jobs at one time. So he asks each foreman at the end of the day to send what we call the daily four. And it's just an email. could be a form. could be lots of different ways to do it, but very simply just an email. Uh, foreman sends in, and his job is to put down what are the top th three priorities for the crew. So, in essence, what are their goals? What are their goals for the following days? Give your top three things that you're working on on this job. Give us a summary of what got finished today. And by finished, what's really important here is what work got actually done. So not we're working on the driveway. That doesn't tell anybody anything. We need to know that the driveway is 100% complete or 50% complete or 25% or that all the plants are in. It can't just be working on the garden. It has to be garden is X percent done. So finished or what got finished is really important. They're a key part of that question. Uh, thirdly, what obstacles are getting in your way? So what's affecting productivity? Are you waiting for materials? Do you have enough crews? Do you, are you waiting for a piece of equipment? Is there equipment breaking down? What are the obstacles that are preventing progress um, the way we saw it happen in the estimate? And what do you need from me and me being Mark or whoever it is that might be supervising the job? For your company, that might be a, a project coordinator, supervisor, department manager. Um, those four questions sort of wrap up and make sure that every day the foreman have a plan for the next day, that they've reported what happened today, that if there are obstacles, we're not finding out about it at the end of the job when we look back and we went way over budget. We're finding out about it each and every day. And if those obstacles weren't reported, then there's no excuse at the end of the job to be over budget, or no good excuse anyway. And if they were reported and they weren't corrected, well, then that's on us in the office 
to, to take the responsibility of not uh, planning or, or managing the job correctly. And of course, there's other external circumstances that might have affected that. But certainly, at least it gives us that uh, if we look back at a job after it went well, or especially if it went not well, uh, we could look back on this and say, okay, if you're trying to assign a responsibility, which was another written question, of how do we know whether it was the estimator or the foreman? Well, when things go wrong, identifying what went wrong and identifying was this dealt with properly. Did the foreman surface it daily? Did we never hear about it? Did the foreman surface and then the office just ignored it? It gets a lot easier to assign blame or assign accountability is a better way to look at it uh, for mistakes and problems. And then finally, the what do you need from me? Make sure that if anybody's waiting for an answer, um, that that's, there's an opportunity to get that forward daily. And if they've asked the question three times and they haven't got an answer, well, then it's on the person who's not delivering the answer. And if they've not asked the question, then it's on the foreman for not planning their job properly. So a very simple communication tool. takes uh, three or four minutes a day at the end of the day to fill out um, and provides us with uh, – it forces planning. It forces uh, planning of, of uh, goals and materials. <clears throat> it also assists us in the – um, in our job velocity and getting stuff done on time. If we're looking at that stuff three times a day for the crew planning and once a day from an office planning perspective, then stuff doesn't go missed for two and three days, and then we hit a spot where it's like, ah, oh, we didn't order the plant material in time, and now crews aren't very productive. Um, just to recap some of what we talked about there, just in these are averages. These are not necessarily, and they won't be the same for every job, but on average, just to give yourself a mental uh, value on every hour loss to mistakes or inefficiency. Um, for design, build, or install work, you're looking at somewhere, again, typically, it could be higher, it could be lower, but typically between about $80 and $120 per man hour of opportunity for each hour lost to productivity. So, you know, uh, the equipment breaks down, they got to drive back to the shop to go get another piece of equipment. Well, that time that that was lost in productivity on the job to go get another piece of equipment is worth about you know eighty to one hundred and twenty dollars an hour. Um, that doesn't mean we're charging one hundred and twenty dollars an hour for our labor on jobs. What it means is if I was to take the total value of the job and divide it by the uh, hours on the job, most jobs are in and around that average. So that's the employee's hourly rate plus equipment costs plus material costs plus overhead and profit. So it's, it's your entire job price divided by the number of hours. Every hour in design, build, construction is worth, every man hour, is worth about $80 to $120. So it gets really expensive. A good way to look at that is, say, doing a delivery. Uh, a vendor may charge you $150 to deliver product to your job site. And it may seem like that's expensive, and I'm going to go send this guy who makes $16 an hour to go pick it up. And that could seem cheaper in the short run. However, when you send the guy to go pick up, typically that's the foreman because he's the one with the license and the truck and the ability to drive the trailer. And then that foreman leaves site, and he gets stuck in traffic, and then he goes and waits at the vendor to get loaded, and then he waits for his paperwork, and then on his way back he stops for coffee, and then he gets back to the job. Well, we've lost two hours of his time. So two hours times $100 an hour average is $200. And while that foreman was gone, how fast were the guys on site working? Probably about half speed because that foreman wasn't there. So now we've lost another... Uh, two hours times two guys. So that's a total of two hours of productivity because of lost speed. So there's another $200. So that delivery that the vendor would have done for $150 cost us about $400 in productivity or, or sales opportunity because of the lost production while we went and picked it up. On the flip side, you look at uh, maintenance, and it's got a far lower revenue per hour. It's about 50 to 65 an hour on average. Again, there's going to be jobs that are higher and lower, but on average, somewhere between 50 and 65, and that's because maintenance does not have a lot of materials. It's mostly just labor and equipment, overhead and profit. So it's certainly lower, but there's a value attached to that, too. You look at every minute it takes to get the guys out of the yard, the time, drive time, if routes aren't organized properly, the slow cleanup at the end of the day. All these things are time that could be spent filling it with, with production or billable revenue, and there's a cost to all those hours. Um, as a crew, if you want to look at it as a crew hour, somewhere, uh, at least for design build, um, the design build is going to be up on the higher end of that, so sort of 350, 375 an hour. Uh, maintenance probably be closer to the 240 an hour mark. But um, you know, if you look at, uh, I'm sorry, maintenance be sorry closer to about 150 an hour and up. But uh, if you're looking for at a design build crew anyway, um, 
it's ex- every crew hour lost to inefficiency, to going to vendors and picking up stuff that wasn't organized properly, to lack of productivity. It's, it really affects your, your sales at the bottom line because every hour is worth around 300 bucks an hour for a three-man crew. So when you look at equipment and you look at tools and the right tools on the job in the context of what, it, what am I losing in sales, not just what it's costing me to put equipment on a job, but what am I losing in sales because we're taking longer to do this work than we should. You know, if we had that work done faster, we could be on to the next job sooner. Um, you know, you look, at a, you look at a crew hour saved in design builds, worth about 300 bucks. That means a full day is worth about $2,400. That means if you can save a week, a year, you could increase your sales by about $12,000. And that's, you know, a $12,000 job is going to take about a week, maybe less. Um, it doesn't take long to pay for, and again, I'll put that in quotes, sort of expensive equipment when you look at it in this context. Um, and a, a, a you know, lease rate on a skid steer or a mini X is probably going to be somewhere between $400 and $900 a month. If you look at it in this context, you know, every, every full day we save in labor is going to pay the cost of that lease. So although it certainly looks expensive to roll out of our yard in the morning and you see every truck with its own skid steer or its own mini X and a bunch of attachments and it looks expensive, but in, in reality, we're able to generate a lot more revenue per crew per person and, uh, and ultimately our costs on each job are, are lower. Moving forward, also, if we're going to look at a lean field to improve job velocity, we should also have a lean office. We've got to walk the walk back in the office, too. And uh, some of the big things in the office to look at are, are uh, using technology to help us um, do more work with less people in the office as well. Um, the first and probably the most important piece, or one of the most important pieces for us, is, is estimating software. It allows uh, our company to have a pricing system. That doesn't necessarily have to be completely transparent for all our estimators, but our estimators all follow a system. So that if I was to give an, a job to estimator A and a job, the, zip, the very same job to estimator B, those two are going to come out very, very similar in total price. And estimator A may have shaved a couple hours, and estimator B may have thought of a different way, but I mean, materials are pretty consistent, and overhead recovery is going to be consistent. Profitability goals are going to be consistent. Both those two, no matter who's estimating and no matter how long they've been with us, are going to come out with a very similar estimate, and that's key, and it's also much faster than generating it by a spreadsheet every time. Um, the software also produces the, the templates that are you know, proposals for customers, which makes it very easy for us on the fly at a customer's kitchen table to make changes, to make edits, to reprint or to re-email, uh, and then get a deal done at the kitchen table rather than having to go back to the office and rework an estimate. Um, and then turning that over, that estimate gets turned into instantly a job planner, and then a time tracking. So that as the crews are, are clocking in and tracking their time to jobs, we're tracking it right back to that very same estimate to get an estimated versus actual comparison. So pretty efficient from that perspective. Um, that, that second component there, the, the time tracking, is huge for job velocity. If we were just, and, and going back to the days where we just threw crews out there and, and it was paperwork driven primarily and maybe not tracked as well as it should have been, we were either not able to provide the crews with up-to-date job progress, or by the time we were able to produce the crews with reports of job progress, that job was finished or almost finished, or whatever the problems we were having happened four or five days ago. The reports were never in a timely fashion. So by using a little bit of technology, um, crews can clock in and clock out on their smartphones. Uh, that not only does their payroll and makes that uh, paperless, uh, it goes right into QuickBooks and not only generates their paychecks, but it also books the time against each job so that the crews can see, uh, or so that our office can see exactly what we spent in labor in every job. But it also provides the crews and the office with real-time job updates. So estimated hours versus actual hours, what percent have we used up to date? And so no foreman at TBG would ever have to wait for any manager or any report to tell them where they stood on their job. They could pull out their phone and they can click one button. And that will show them exactly for the task they're working on, what was estimated and what they've used up to so far. So there's no excuse for any foreman not to know where they stand on the job. And that is huge. Well, I mean, we all know from the way we work, people get done, people work harder, people uh, find that extra gear when there's, uh, when there's a due date, when there's a deadline. We all work the same way, whether it's estimating or 
preparing for a webinar, doing your homework when you're a kid. We all put it into an extra gear when we approach that deadline. And um, by just throwing the crews out there every day with no deadlines and no reports and no feedback, you're going to get slower progress for sure than a company that does the opposite, which the field and the office always know where they stand on the job. It makes a huge difference in job velocity. Um, not only does it help us with job velocity, but it also helps us with the costs and, and staff and overhead. We're looking at no double entry of paperwork. So we can save at least an entire full-time person at TBG anyway because we're not entering paperwork by hand, which is what we used to do. Take the paperwork, key it into a spreadsheet, key that into QuickBooks, key this into a job thing, build a job binder of job costs. All that time is not necessary anymore. It just happens as the crews clock in and out. No person needed to do that. Um, certainly reduce mistakes. Translating paperwork was always filled with mistakes. And then we either were entering it wrong or we were driving the foreman crazy trying to get the right information every day to fix the mistakes. And uh, again, as, as the more, the more uh, technology gets used, the more systems you can put in place to eliminate mistakes. You know, your crews can't leave a piece of information blank. It will not let them submit it until they fill it out. Or fill it out. They can't type the wrong job name. There's a fixed list of jobs. Pick one of them. You can't screw up the address. You can't screw up the date. These things just help us work more efficiently from an office perspective. Um, certainly reduced time hunting and correcting down those mistakes. Uh, reduced, and, and in fact, you could almost put it as no time processing payroll. That just happens automatically. And we get much, much more reliable job information. The crews use the smartphones because that's how they get paid. When the smartphones use that very same, if they don't use the smartphone, they won't get paid for those hours. So, of course, they're going to do that. We're going to use that very same information to then job cost a job, which means that's going to be accurate because um, the crews want to get paid accurately. If you look at uh, if you look at you know the cost of a again you're looking at the cost of a of, of a paperless app you know, roughly around ten dollars a month for most of them um, uh, versus paperwork which is free and we'll put free in quotes but when you look at the time savings in the paperless app just like the piece of equipment we looked at earlier uh, timesheets take about the same time to fill out but reports are generally instant versus phone calls and times generating report from a, an office perspective. Uh, we certainly save lots of time doing uh, data entry on the back end, on the office end. No time to do payroll, like four to eight hours a month. Every payroll period is saved, or sorry, every, every couple of weeks of payroll time is saved. Uh, there's no time to do job costing. It's always there. It's right in front of us uh, versus four to eight hours every couple of weeks of processing that data. Billing, billing reports are available instant. What got done, what didn't get done, how much it was worth instantly, no time processing that. And, and the accountability across the company is much stronger than it was when everybody was waiting for out-of-date paperwork. Um, we can take that time in the office and use it for planning. So it doesn't, you could certainly grow a bigger company with less people. We only have about, uh, you know, six or seven full-time staff in the office to run the, the volume that we do. Most of those tasks are covered by technology, and we use that time that we save instead to better plan a job so that we're not entering in historical data that tells us we're losing money. We're actually not entering data and instead spending time preparing a job so that we don't lose money, just a, just a much more effective use of the time. I'm not job costing certainly an important part, but uh, we'll get a lot more value out of, uh, out of preparing a job better. So finally, and just to wrap up here, the last part is this engaged staff. And some of the key things about building a more accountable, more engaged staff include clear job descriptions for our new hires. So it's, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're responsible for. And, and this is the career path that you could follow to make more money ultimately. Um, job descriptions are written out. They're standardized uh, templates. Um, these are from the LMN Systems Library, and they're right from our TBG ones. They talk about who, you're, who you report to, what your capabilities are, and, and what your roles and duties are. That's then followed up by sort of a, an opportunity and wage chart. These are the different wages that each role makes. This is how you can move up and sideways on the chain to grow into different roles, and depending on what interests you. you know, maybe you want to be a truck driver, maybe you want to be a carpenter, but this is sort of how you would progress to get there. And it's tough to, to convince people that landscaping is a good career. So it's, the onus is on us as the owners and hirers when we receive new employees to, to instill that in them, that there is the opportunity for a good career in this, in this uh, trade because certainly that's not the perception. Um, making people accountable to information, giving them information and then holding them accountable to it is, is big. I, I guarantee if you had uh, pick your sport, hockey, baseball, football, whatever you like, 
and they played with no scoreboard, you're not going to see the same performance that you see week in and week out with a scoreboard and stats. It's, it's essential. There's just no way you're going to get the same motivation out of staff without them knowing if they're doing well or if they're not. And if they're not doing well and they don't know it and you don't know it, well, of course, they're going to continue not to do well. There's no incentive to do any better, especially when they're getting paid by the hour. Um, paying people what they're worth are key. Uh, you know, we set the production goal for the foreman. We know our profitable percentage of field wages, and then we can give that foreman. So back to the first or first couple slides where we set a, a budget for the crew. This is what you should produce at the end of the year. Well, as that foreman wants to get raises, it's very easy to use that same math to then say, okay, we can get a raise. You need to deliver this level of production or vice versa. You delivered this level of production. We're going to bump you up, and this is why. And, and that gives the foreman an objective way of understanding why they're getting a raise, not just they got you on the right day. And there's the math behind it, right? We're going to take the crew wages. We're going to divide them by whatever our company's profitable field labor ratio is to come up with their goal. Not, not very complicated, very easy for everybody to understand, and pretty simple to communicate beginning and the end of the year. Um, you can do the same thing for sales and designers. You can start with a sales goal and look at out of that sales goal for them. You need to subtract profit, their salary, and job costs, and, and overhead. And as long as those balance, then we're good. But if they're out of balance, if there's a negative number at the bottom of that, then we know that salesperson or designer isn't isn't necessarily pulling their weight, and, and this is why, and this is how much you can make if you do that better. So that objective reward system really goes from, from right from the company budget down all the way through through the office and through the field staff to make everybody accountable to production, which is another reason why we uh, seem to deliver a much higher level of productivity per person. Uh, everybody's focused. Everybody understands their career sort of depends on maximizing the productivity. Uh, at the end of the year, if we beat our company sales goal by, a, uh, say, in this case, $100,000, let's say your overhead percentage was 25%. This is one way to give an incentive system. Take whatever you beat your sales goal by. You really don't have any overhead on that extra sales. Your overhead's your overhead, whether you hit or, or, or didn't hit your sales goal in most cases. So beat your sales goal by X. Well, you've, you really have no overhead on that extra sales, so that can be turned into bonus capital for the staff. And then you can decide how to how to divvy it out. Here's just an example. We're pretty heavy on foreman incentives, uh, less for overhead staff and less for crew, but it's the foreman who ultimately need to be uh, incentivized the most because they're going to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the jobs. So it's really important that they've got, uh, they're highly, highly motivated. Um, we don't necessarily have to bonus all the bottom end laborers, uh, but as long as the foremen are motivated, they're going to make sure that on their job site stuff has happened in the right way. Uh, just as a sort of final wrap-up before we take questions there, if anybody is interested and has attended or has not attended a workshop in the past, we sort of we do workshops with Caterpillar and, and most of the state associations and national associations across uh, Canada and the U.S. and as far as Australia, uh, where you bring in your financials, and, and we show you exactly how we would set our sales goals, and you, and you do it right along with us. So you leave that workshop with a budget, goals for your crews, and uh, an estimating system that makes sure you recover your company's overhead specific to your numbers, and it's always been a big, uh, so it's been a popular event, and seem to get a lot of good feedback of it. So if you're ever interested, you can. Uh, we've got snow workshops actually coming up next this winter, and uh, or this summer in Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, and Toronto to get ready for the winter. And if you're in interested there, there's a, a link on the page there, snow.golmn.com where you can find out more information. And um, even if you're not a snow-only company, the concepts are the same, coming in, building your budget, all that kind of stuff is good. Um, I think we'll free it up at this point to take some live questions, yeah, and uh, I'll turn that over to our moderators and see if I can help. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. That was an awesome presentation, lots of good tips. I know I took a lot of notes uh, myself, so um, hopefully our audience did as well. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in live, and I just want to encourage everybody, if you have questions, um, you can type them into your um, Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to them. Um, there's a couple straightforward ones that came through, Mike. Um, first of all, what software are you using at TBG for clocking in, clocking out, and having the uh, foreman able to view their crew man hours and costs? We use LMN, and LMN is Landscape Management Network, and that's the company I work for, to be 100% uh, transparent. We actually built LMN at TBG. We, we used to have a, a payroll software that um, 
that made our time tracking efficient, but didn't necessarily help us with the job management, didn't show us that estimated actual hours. So we built LMN originally just for ourselves, for TBG, and eventually we turned it into a, a piece of software. And that's what does our estimates and our, and our job tracking. So it allows the crews to track their payroll and allows us to track job um, progress at the same time. Okay, great. I thought that's what you might say, but I just that was a legitimate question that came in, so I wanted to throw it out there. Um, good, good. So, someone else is asking, what's an example of a power wheelbarrow? Is there like a brand name that you can associate with a with a piece of equipment like that? Yeah, I'll give you a couple brand names. You could look up uh, Kubota has them, and so does a company called Cormidi. Uh, C-O-R-M-I-D-I, -I. Um, and you can actually just uh, Google Power Wheelbarrow and look at images or look at the website and you'll find some. But, uh, you know, Power Wheelbarrow is essentially a motorized wheelbarrow. You can get them with wheels, you can get them with tracks, you can get them with a dump bucket on the front. So it's, it's a wheelbarrow and a bucket. Uh, you can get ones that lift up in the air so that they can uh, dump right into the back of a, tick, a pickup truck. There's all kinds of different configurations, and if you Google that, you can see some samples. But um, for the cost of, you know, between, say, $250 and $300 a month lease, and I'm just giving some ballpark numbers there, they can, uh, they will do the work of three people on a wheelbarrow each. So you get one person can move as much earth in and out of a backyard as, as three people. Um, so from a, from a cost perspective, if it's only costing us $300 a month to lease this thing, if I can use it for one day, I've, I've covered the cost. Okay, great. Um... We have a question about production-based pay, um, where you're paying somebody as a percentage of production rather than an hourly rate. What are your What's your take on that? Um, yeah, that's. Um, I, I have to be careful with that one because there's some wage legality issues in some areas, and I'm not sure where the question's coming from. So I don't want to come. I, I just want to make make it clear. We don't have a system like that um, per se. We, we do as close as a system as we can to that. Um, so I don't have a lot of personal experience with doing that. Might not be the best person to answer it. But certainly on a yearly level, that's kind of what we're doing, right? We're saying that we're going to peg your wages to a certain percent of what you produce in a year. So at the end of the year, rather than, say, the end of the week, we're going to look at how much revenue they produced and, and peg their wages for next year around that percentage. You know, obviously – playing it smart about years that we think we're going to hit our sales goal and not hit our sales goal and all the, all the exceptions that may have happened that year. Um, so we kind of do it on an annual level, but, uh, but not necessarily on a, on a weekly level. I, there, I know there are some companies that do that, and I've heard some good stories of companies that do that. I've also heard some challenges they've had, too, in terms of keeping staff and reporting it properly and not being too transparent. And what do you do about warranty work, or what do you do about a guy who quits and leaves you about a warranty work? There's there's some obviously challenges that you have to deal with in setting up a system like that as well. Okay, great. Um, we had a couple questions submitted before the webinar um, about overtime, so I wanted to hear your take on that. Um, specifically, you know, how do you know when to add an additional crew versus just running overtime? Is there a key metric um, that you look for there? I think. Um, I think it's hard to put a, a finger on a, on a precise number for overtime, but I will, I will share this. I think companies are too scared of overtime. I, I don't necessarily think overtime is a, is a bad thing. Here's a quick example. Um, it's, you know, your Thursday or Friday night, doesn't matter, uh, and you're maybe two hours away from finishing up a job. Uh, but you're going to go into overtime for those two hours. Well, it's going to be a lot cheaper for me to pay two hours of overtime, have that crew wrap up that job that night, and be on to my next job Monday morning than it would be for the crew to stop at 40 hours to come back and then for me to have to remobilize my entire labor force back to that same job on Monday and lose half a day, possibly even a full day of production just for the sake of avoiding overtime. A um, couple other examples. Uh, the more overtime you have, the more revenue your crews are doing um, for the same equipment. So if I was to reduce overtime and hire another crew, I'm also looking at, I mean, just start adding up the cost. I need another truck. I need another trailer full of tools. I need fuel. I need filters. I need uh, maintenance on the truck. And just think of the windshield time every single day that that crew has got. So I'm, we're not that scared of, of, of overtime. And, and also think about overtime is the fact that, when your crews are working overtime, especially if it's productive overtime, especially if they're getting work done, 
Uh, not, I don't mean falling behind on jobs necessarily, even though those things I just talked about would apply to that as well. But if the overtime is productive overtime, i.e. they're generating new revenue during that overtime, chances are, and again, this is going to change for every company, but chances are your overhead and your fixed equipment costs are falling faster than your wages are increasing, meaning you're reducing your overhead more, fa- uh, more quickly than your, than your cost of wages are increasing. It, it, it could, in fact, be more profitable to be working overtime. Plus, your crews make more money, which means they're going to stick with you longer. And in many cases, your crews are going to start recruiting family, friends, other good workers. Your best people are going to try to bring other best people into your company, knowing that you guys pay overtime and offer at the end of the year a better compensation package because of that overtime. So, um, yeah, I'm, I, we're, we're certainly less focused on managing overtime than, than, some, other, uh, than some other companies. Okay, great. Um, you talked during the presentation a little bit, <clears throat> well, more than a little bit, about accountability, and we had a specific question about accountability. Once you have a company that is based on accountability, how do you maintain it is the question. Yeah, I, I, that one certainly comes back to regular reporting and, and the free flow of information. So accountability is nice at the beginning of the year to say, hey, this is where we need to be everybody by the end of the year. But if you don't talk about that regularly, and if there's not a feedback loop letting people how we're, know how we're doing, then those accountability systems are going to fall off just as fast as, as the meeting that, that put them in place. Um, so it comes back to you know, job, job hours, estimated versus actual, constantly, every day, every hour if you can. Uh, it goes back to the time. But even if you have a paper-driven system and it's weekly, uh, something to come back so that everybody knows, A, it's being watched, and B, you're being held accountable for it. Updating your sales goals and sales progress regularly. So if you've set a production goal, as we have for the company and for crews, then monthly, quarterly, weekly, whatever you feel like is necessary, updating the crews where we stand so that there's, again, accountability back to the goal. It's not a beginning of the meeting, not a beginning of the year meeting that you can have and then just expect that for the rest of the, for the, rest of the, uh, the year, everybody will just naturally be accountable to those, those systems. Think of it like a scoreboard. Those athletes, again, they're accountable to the, to the score of the game because everybody in the world is going to see that score, and you can look up at the scoreboard and see all the stats. Um, it's going to determine whether your team wins and loses. It's going to determine how much money you make in next year's contract. As companies, we have to do as much as we can to provide similar incentive systems, a score for individuals and for the company, and, and keep coming back to that. Okay, great. Um, and we are at time, but it's, all of our attendees are staying on and seem to be engaged, so we'll go over just a little bit. Um, I'll ask you one more question, and then we'll, we'll do a, a video, a quick video, and then we'll wrap up. Um, wanted to ask about equipment. So there was a couple of equipment questions, but a good one. We'll kind of make it a two-part question. What's a good rule of thumb for renting versus buying equipment? And then also, how at TBG do you evaluate you know, which equipment manufacturer you work with? Sure. Um, so the rent versus buy is uh, these are these. This is not black and white, but a typical rule of thumb on on smaller equipment, like a quick cut saw, for instance. You know, if you're if you've got to rent that saw, sort of 10 to 12 days a year, you, you're probably in the, you should be buying it. You can you can look at the the cost of rent. I mean, if you've rented a, a quick cut saw 12 times, you basically bought yourself a quick cut saw. So it's pretty simple to look at a daily rental versus, you know, if I'm going to use this 12 times or need to rent this 12 times, um, it, it pays for itself. On a skid steer, mini X, larger equipment, you're probably closer to 20 times a year if you're just to do the math uh, on the daily rental rate versus what you'd pay in, say, a lease per month. Uh, if you can use it 20 times a year, you're, you're, probably, you're probably good. Uh, that's as close as a rule of thumb as I can give without getting too specific. But I'll also say this. If we're even close to that threshold – we're probably we're probably going out and buying or leasing, uh, given the, given the um, you know if there's probably a few jobs we wouldn't have gone out to the trouble of renting it that we if we owned it we would use it. So not only will it help those 12 to 20 or whatever it is, but we probably use it another five to ten times. So if we're even close, chances are Mark's getting it. Um, as for equipment uh, dealers. Um, We've learned this lesson the hard way on, on a variety of different pieces. We've always found that a good product with a crappy dealer is, is worthless. Um, 
it's a lot about the service and the dealership. And for us, the service and the reliability of the piece of equipment is is paramount because that goes back to sales opportunity. Every hour that machine's down, it's costing our crews sort of $300 an hour in production or productivity lost because we don't have the machine to do the job effectively. So um, we're looking at... Uh, we're looking at the dealer. We're looking at the size of their shop. What are the wait times for repairs? Um, what is their parts inventory like? If I'm, you know, when you're buying machines, ask your dealer for a few random parts off the machine. Do you carry this in stock? Call, anonymously call and, or, and ask if they have something available or find out how long things are going to take for some basic replaceable parts. Um, how fast can they get your machine back in service? Are you going to be waiting in a week at the service bay or, or, or a day? Um, do they do mobile repairs? That's a big one to have. It's more expensive. Again, in theory, it's more expensive. You'll pay more an hour to have a mobile repair come out to your site to fix it. But then I've saved all that time floating that machine back and forth. Uh, resale value of right. machines, uh, financing options. Yeah, these are other things certainly we look at. And you know, to tip my hat to John, we've, we've been a Caterpillar customer for our, our major equipment uh, for most, and, and it, we, we tend to go with more premier brands because they tend to service and back their equipment um, stronger than some of the stuff that's cheaper up front. Okay, great. And then I just wanted to point out to attendees, many of you pre-submitted questions, and we obviously can't get to all of them, but Mike has offered, he's going to try to answer as many as possible and post those answers on the LMN blog, which you can visit golmn.com slash blog. We'll also post some of those on the landscape management website. Um, so, so check that out for answers to many of these questions over the coming weeks and months. And then finally, before we conclude, we're just going to show a short video from Caterpillar. The Coleman's run a successful landscaping business as a family. Frank Sr. and his sons Frank and Greg work together to continue growing their business with the help of Cat Machines. Uh, the machines are great, but when you get down to the dealer, they're the ones that keep you going every single day, uh, keep the, the machines running perfectly, and if you need something special, they're there for us. Work tools for us are essential because, like I said, one minute I'm grading, next minute I can run over and change a tool out to the tiller, and I'm tilling within five minutes. Uh, you know, even the same with the 308 uh, excavator. With the quick attach, I can go from a bucket to the screener and back in a matter of five, ten minutes. And uh, that's what keeps me going and keeping me working so fast and doing multiple jobs. Renting from Cat Rental has given us a ton of flexibility from the standpoint of, like I said, I was in Iowa two days ago. Today I'm in Tennessee. Equipment was waiting for me when I got here. Um, if, if I had my own, you know, we'd have to truck it. If not, if I, if I might even be by, driving the truck. So at that point, I'm tired. Uh, so I think, for instance, yesterday there was just three of us here. We knocked in 13 eight-inch trees. We started at 10, finished at six. It's a great day. Uh, everybody was safe. Equipment ran great. No arguments. And and like I said, you're a family. So at the end of the day, you know, you, you guys walk away, you get a pat them on the back, and I feel good about the day too. Thank you for attending today's webinar. If you have any more questions, do not hesitate to contact our presenters at the email addresses on your screen now. Links to their email addresses are in the bios on the left of the webinar console. An on-demand recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon and will be available online for a full year at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. If you'd like to share this webinar with your colleagues, you can do so via any of the links on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also download today's 
slides by clicking on the green folder icon at the bottom right of the webinar console. If you aren't already a Landscape Management Magazine subscriber, we'd like to invite you to sign up today for free. All you have to do is click on the Landscape Management logo at the bottom right of the webinar console and fill out a short form. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.